I've been looking forward to uploading this content for quite some time. Today we're going to look at the original slides from my April 2016, a superior electronic health record using concept design presentation. As I mentioned, these are the original untouched slides that I worked on as a second year medical resident in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And the initial presentation was a short 10 minute slick presentation that went on to win the uh, resident choice award for best podium presentation at the research day. I have since forgotten the script that went along with that presentation, and therefore the commentary which is going to go along with these slides has been uh, rewritten uh, today. There's a lot more detail than in the initial presentation. This is going to go for longer than 10 minutes, but the original slides are all the same. And of course, anytime you dig out old material, especially, you know, something from up to two and a half years ago, it's always a bit embarrassing to look back at the old work. Many things seem outdated. Certain design elements look really poorly constructed, uh, limited by very bad UX skills I had. And uh, there was, of course, a number of horrifying spelling errors uh, in the presentation, but the way that it's built in Keynote with the original designs being built in Slack, it's very difficult to actually fix any of these spelling errors. So uh, please uh, bear with me on that front. But I think that the principles in this presentation are, f still provide a lot of really core fundamental ideas on how to approach the design of an electronic health record. And that's the part which I'm excited to talk about here today. If you're listening to this on the audio version, I highly recommend that you watch the video version on YouTube. It really relies a lot on the visual imagery. And without further ado, let's delve into a superior electronic health record using concept design. Now, the trouble with trying to do innovation in electronic health records, and especially around the user interface design, is that you have uh, quite a lot of overhang with you know, legacy systems, high costs to develop new systems. And so trying to do a research project uh, in this area is pretty unfeasible. Now, the workaround though, is to develop a electronic health record using concept design. Now, concept design is something which has been uh, a wonderful tool that is a technique that frees one from the financial and bureaucratic limitations of reality. It allows you to imagine the future on how something should be without the baggage of the past. And concept design encourages new thinking and the ability to really advance and push a field forward. We've seen concept design used in uh, architecture innovation. It's used quite a lot in automobile innovation. And I believe that we can use these same techniques and apply them to electronic healthcare records. I'd like to very quickly thank the two supervisors I had for this presentation, Dr. Hadjiakos and Dr. Batad. Uh, they essentially took a gamble on me and signed off as a resident to allow me to spend my month of March 2016 uh, designing EHR mockups as a, uh, quote, research project. And the fundamental purpose of the project at that time was to demonstrate how a better user interface for EHRs is possible to build. And the constraints which I applied to the project was I wanted to simply replace existing electronic medical record functionality. So this project wasn't supposed to imagine how the EHR should work in the future, how it's going to incorporate voice recognition, augmented reality, machine-aided diagnosis. It was really to try to say, how could we do what we currently do much better? We'll start into the uh, methods used for this research project and the design process. To start, I looked through thousands of user interfaces from many different fields, really trying to figure out what were key design elements when creating complex software uh, that made the software really effective. And my absolute favorite user interface from the perspective of data visualization remains the Bloomberg Trading Terminal. As you can see on screen here, it's used for trading stocks and the Bloomberg Trading Terminal excels at data density and in particular speed of use because of its keyboard operated entry. Now, of course, I realize 
that uh, such a user interface is impractical in healthcare from the keyboard only entry because there's a very high steep learning curve to memorize all the keyboard shortcuts. However, uh, for people who use this tech tool in uh, finance, they absolutely love how blazingly fast it is. And you can just look on screen and see the incredible amount of pretty data. The fundamental texts that I relied on to understand the visual display of quantitative information come from Edward Tuffy, who really is the godfather and founding of that field of the visual display of quantitative information. And he's also written several papers specifically related to medical data visualization, such as the 1994 Lancet publication. I also looked through about 20 other books on dashboard design, visual display of data, but ultimately all those books are really derivative works of Tuffy's work. Uh, the only difference is that they lack his uh, rather uh, funny writing style. Another book of particular interest was Rethinking the Electronic Health Record by Dr. Martin Wahool. And it's a bit hard, I read that book while working on this project, and it's a bit hard to know exactly where his ideas start, uh, and then where my ideas start, and where we merge and uh, converge and overlap. And so any ideas w in this presentation, which are also found in his very important book, uh, were not meant to be plagiarized or stolen. I think at, in just in retrospect, it was hard to exactly know where we happen to converge on the same ideas um, through independent thought. We'll move on now, and once the research had been done, it was time to start laying out all the components required in a, a user interface for an EHR, trying to group them, simplify them, bring them together. I used a lot of the uh, IDEO human-centered design process. It was very popular back in uh, 2016. I found using their how can we prompts to be very effective. And ultimately, uh, the high scale overview and stenciling of the system be, then was turned into drafting mockups, going through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of iterations with paper and pen. And of course, I really feel that paper and pen is the only way to do this type of work. Uh, the moment you try to do it on a computer, your ability to really innovate is slows down. And during this time of doing uh, paper pen mockups, the whole goal here is to try to figure out how you can simplify, how you can merge functions, how you can remove buttons, how you can make one interface have as many uh, different uh, versatility as possible, and making an interface which allows any user who's never used it before to navigate it uh, intuitively. Once the paper and pen process was finished, it was time to move uh, digital and to actually build some visual mockups. And so I'd like to introduce you to what I call SIR, the Concept Electronic Health Record. Now SIR is designed to be fast, smart, safe, and simple. These are four attributes that I feel are core to any electronic health record and unfortunately are probably not attributes many would ascribe to the existing uh, EHR systems. The very first thing which we will focus on is the importance of a multitasking workspace. And the ability to multitask is critical in medical workflows to be able to pull up notes, labs, orders effortlessly and view them concurrently. The current systems, the difficulty which it takes to both uh, navigate the panels and tabs and to try to view this information concurrently really hinders uh, working digitally. In this case here, we see that there's a workspace on the left and a workspace on the right. We have a split screen user interface. Currently, the left interface is set to overview and the right interface is set to the note tabs. And if you want, uh, there's also a, a panel here, a navigation bar where you could go to uh, messaging, notifications, and other components of the EHR. If you want, you could switch to graph, and this is a sandbox mode, which we'll discuss later. And we'll now move the right workspace into search. And here in search, you can see that you can either search through the patient's chart, up-to-date, PubMed, other resources. And 
these uh, electronic record here was really designed to work on a big screen. That's what I was envisioning when I was designing this particular set of mockups. And having two workspaces is great, but it's even better if you could in fact have uh, four. And so being able to put an additional external monitor, which has its own set of uh, workspaces, uh, is uh, really a, a important way to understand how this system is meant to operate. Of course, you could also shrink it down onto a mobile phone. You have the similar tab system across the top of overview notes, graph, and search. When I built the system, though, the focus wasn't as much on mobile. The, my most recent set of mock-ups from October 1st, 2018, that presentation really focuses on designing a mobile and tablet-first EHR. And so I recommend searching for that on YouTube if interested. And of course, being able to print out the output from the EHR in a layout which is similar to the intuitive screen layout is very important. Unfortunately, most EHRs today produce essentially unreadable piles of junk data, which are not suitable for human consumption. We'll go back here to the main screen looking at that left workspace. Really, one of the core fundamental principles in designing the EHR was trying to place all of the necessary high-use data within either immediately seen on screen or within one click away. And the way that I've helped try to do that is by using this concept of sliders. So here we have two different columns, and each column is on its own slider. If we were to slide this column here on the left down, we review some of the other static patient information, such as their contacts, demographics, and family members. And we can also slide this panel on the right down, being able to view social history, family history, and allergies. Again, you could of course customize this to be able to have other static data fields viewed, or you could slide you could edit the data by clicking on a particular panel. And of course, you just need to slide them up to get back to the original screen. The second big principle was data density. And this is one of the reoccurring themes of Edward Tuffy, that having more data per square inch provides greater understanding into the story the data is trying to tell. And when done properly, Increased data density does not create confusion, it does not create busyness, but it actually provides clarity and makes it easier to see the signal among the noise. And so in this way, that is part of the, why the Bloomberg trading terminal is so great, is it is able to allow traders to really understand the data well. And I believe that in healthcare, which is ultimately a data-driven field, we can reap the same benefits of well-presented data. Let's look in a few examples of this, specifically focusing in here on the left panel with the labs. This lab panel interface is strongly influenced, pretty much almost copied, by Edward Tuffy's works on sparklines and the display of medical data. What you're looking at here is over 450 different discrete data points, 24 individual lab tests, a week's worth of data, as well as the historic data from a year ago. You can see all of this on screen. You can digest the themes and the takeaways very easy. There's also a top bar, which in retrospect is horribly designed, very sloppy, but the concept is that you could, if you want, switch the spark lines into a, a grid so you could actually view the absolute numbers over time and you could, of course, change the time intervals. Let's uh, explain this presentation in a little bit more detail. If you look at creatinine here, what you see is a yellow box. That first yellow box represents labs from a year ago. The green box represents labs from the date of admission. Each alternating gray box is another day of admission. And the current day is the blue box to here. The height of the box represents the range of normal for those labs, from the lower range of normal to the upper range of normal. And as you can see, the red dot is approximately one multiple above the range of normal. 
And so it is very easy to see that this patient's creatinine is outside the normal range, that on admission it was outside the normal range, that it that a year ago it was outside the normal range, and it's trended and gotten worse over time. The line in this case is solid, representing reasonably continuous data over this period of time. You can see some isolated dots from previous uh, results representing uh, more discrete data fields. And you can see, for instance, in the magnesium and phosphate that the most recent values from those labs are from two days ago. You can see that the patient's liver enzymes have trended abnormal, many multiples above the range of normal the entire admission. You can see their white count is improving. And as far as the design of this, the end dot, which is actually a little bit too big here in retrospect, is in red when the lab is abnormal, and the lab itself is in red when it is abnormal. It's important to note that if you go in and put the entire word of the lab into red as well, the interface becomes too busy. Let's look at another example here of how we can use high data density to tell a story. I really enjoyed working on this vitals panel, and it was I think shows a lot more information than the, the way it's typically represented in most systems. Let's start again with the top. We're looking at a week's worth of data, and we have the timeline represented the same down here. I actually think this is probably should be at the top, and it's not very clear what it is. But again, green is admission, gray alternating boxes are each day of admission, and blue is today. So one week worth of data. We start with temperature. We have dots indicating discrete measurements of the patient's temperature. We have a gray box in the background representing, again, the range of normal. And we see that the patient's temperature while was elevated on admission and has since been in the range of normal the rest of the week. The most recent value is 37.6 degrees Celsius. The patient's heart rate is a continuous line representing uh, that they're on telemetry and we have continuous data monitoring. And we again see that it's currently in the normal range. Blood pressure, I absolutely love the way that blood pressure is being displayed here. It's, uh, be it's really beautiful. You can both see the systolic pressure represented at the top of the vertical line and the diastolic pressure represented at the bottom of the vertical line. You also can see in a very slightly darker, um, th thick dot in the middle of that line what the map is. The reason I really like this display is you can see the frequency of blood pressure monitoring based on how many lines there are. You can see exactly what that blood pressure uh, systolic variation is. You can see the diastolic variation, and it's easy to see the pulse pressure difference. It's uh, fits an incredible amount of data in a very tiny amount of space here. And I hope uh, more systems adopt such techniques. Let's move on to oxygen. Oxygen, we have a line here, again, representing continuous data, showing uh, that the patient's current oximetry is 92% on room air. You'll note that there is a gray background from the admission and this represents the number of liters of oxygen the patient was on. So as you can see, when the patient came in, they ended up going on to, these thick lines are units of increments of five, so they ended up being on over 15 liters of oxygen on day one of admission. This was slowly titrated down over the current week, and the patient has now been off oxygen for about two or three days. I am very surprised that I have not seen systems superimpose the number of liters of oxygen, or conversely, you could use the FiO2 concurrent with the tracing of the oximetry. Because as you can see, if you only looked at the oximetry result, it would not tell the story relating to this patient's uh, respiratory status. You could also imagine a way to concurrently visualize respiratory rate concurrent with this visualization. We go to the last set of graphics here in the lowest corner in the bottom left. This one here was uh, designed uh, by Alan Beaudry, 
again from Manitoba, and it is designed to solve the problem of trying to correlate a patient's weight and their fluid balance. As people who have worked on medicine wards know, they often don't correlate on a day-to-day basis properly. And so the way which we can visually represent this is by plotting the net change in a patient's fluid balance on a daily basis, as well as the net change in a patient's weight on a daily basis. So in theory, as you can see, when the patient comes in, the net change is at zero. Over the corresponding days, the light gray line, their fluid balance, increases as they're resuscitated. Their weight also has a net positive change over the corresponding three days. It then peaks at around day four of admission, and and both the f- their total net fluid balance and their weight falls over the rest of the week. We can see the absolute numbers here for the most recent change in the last day, as well as the total change since admission. A really easy way to uh, track these metrics. The next slide, admittedly, was in the initial 2016 uh, slide deck, but it was hidden, so I didn't show it. And again, that's because in that 2016 presentation, I really wanted to focus on uh, understanding how we could make the EHR in its current state better, not try to imagine what it should be like in the future. And so at that time, I thought that using natural language processing, being able to have the physician speak into the system and have what they say, for instance, on exam respiratory uh, lung fields had crackles at the base with an expiratory wheeze, the cardiovascular S1 and 2 are normal with no extra heart sounds, that that should ultimately be uh, ingested by the computer and then parsed and then filed into the discrete data field. So under the cardio exam data fields, it would store that there's no extra heart sounds and that the S1 and S2 are normal. Since 2016, much has happened, and in the last two and a half years, there's a number of startups actually working on this exact feature. And so I've added it back into the slide deck because I think it's probably, I haven't seen demos yet, but I suspect we're getting close to prime time on being able to use this. What we'll do now is we'll move away from the left workspace, the overview panels, into the right workspace, the notes panel. And to start, what I would like to discuss is the concept of a medical time machine. You can see here at the uh, top of this workspace, you have the ability to change the date. It is currently set to the most recent date, but in theory, you could slide through this date changer and it would scroll back the medical record. So not only would that allow you to essentially play the patient's chart forward or backward to see how the notes evolve, but while scrolling through the uh, time feature here, it also changes the other side, the overview panel, which is showing the labs and the vitals. And so this really allows you to essentially take the chart, uh, play the whole chart forward and play the whole chart backwards and watch the patient's medical story unfold on screen something very difficult to do in contemporary medical records. The next thing I would like to draw your attention to is that each of these notes is a th- contains threaded information, or it's a fully integrated note, meaning that these active hospital issues, and we have the inactive hospital issues here, and the resolved hospital issues collapse down here, but these active hospital issues summary panels, each contain both a note, both medications, uh, physician notes, physician orders, as well as updates. And it's really easy to see all this information on one particular integrated summary panel. And in the current state on most medical record systems that I've seen, you would have to open up the lab separate, then the order separate, then the note separate, then the medication separate, then the uh, progress notes separate, and within each of these buckets, the information would not actually be sorted around the active issues as they're being displayed here. The 
second part I would like to draw your attention to, to here is that under diabetes, we display the information, the glucose readings in a physiologic uh, separation, the way that physicians think, separating random blood sugars from uh, morning, lunch, dinner, and PM. One other item which is a bit novel is that we have a column here to represent the intake. So where the patient has not eaten any food, where they've had half their food and where they've had a full meal. And this is very important in being able to judge the corresponding glucose reading to not only see how much insulin they had, but to see whether they ate. So for instance, if a patient is NPO because they're in a surgery ward, the intake column would read NPO. Again, uh, core information when trying to understand the trends in glucose uh, all in one very simple uh, visualization. The next uh, piece that I would like to draw your attention to is this medication mini line. The medication mini line, each line represents one day. And so in this case, we have two lines, today and yesterday. The filled in circles represent medications were given and their approximate placement on this line represents the time of day. And so you can see in this case that yesterday evening, the patient received several extra doses of Ventolin close to the evening and overnight hours. Today, the patient has received their morning medications, but they still have to receive their afternoon uh, Atrovent puffers. Again, a lot of data in a very tiny amount of space, and you can see exactly the trend which is happening here related to the COPD exacerbation. At the end of the line for prendazone and levofloxacin, we have two numbers. Each, the prendazone is currently on day two of treatment, and there's a total of five days anticipated for treatment duration. In the case of levofloxacin, we're on day two of treatment, and there's an anticipated seven days of treatment duration. Those lines without numbers at the end mean that an anticipated treatment duration has actually not yet been set. Let's move on to the next component, which relates to the fact that we have threaded in-line and in-note orders. If I were to hover over the congestive heart failure panel here, what I could do is I could uh, very easily see that the patient has at 7.58 this morning, Dr. Berry came and ordered, that's the plus sign, Lasix, as well as a chest X-ray. What we are doing here is we are integrating the order directly concurrent with the note. This means that Dr. Berry doesn't have to write a note stating I'm gonna order Lasix and a chest X-ray, and then have to move to the other part of the medical record to actually place these orders, as you would on a paper record, but instead can actually place the order for the Lasix and chest X-ray in, and then use this as part of the clinical note. Afterwards, we see that we have update statuses that the chest X-ray was performed. Uh, the seven should actually be an eight, there's an error there. And then we have Dr. Farmer coming along an hour later writing a pointed clinical observation, responding well to treatment, chest x-ray improving. And because the, uh, the status updates and the orders are all threaded together in the note, Dr. Farmer doesn't have to say, chest x-ray result is back, Lasix was ordered earlier today, they're responding well. All this information is there. The physician can really focus on adding their clinical value, which is their summary statements and impressions and this speeds up documentation. What we could also do is now demonstrate the clinical markdown language. If you were to, for instance, click on the plus here, we can now go in and use this panel similar to a uh, command prompt or a command line editor for anyone who remembers this. So for instance, you can see that where the current cursor is, it timestamps your name and the time you're about to enter uh, into the system, and you could very easily go in and write a short note. If 
you want, though, you can use a clinical markup language. And the clinical markup language, for instance, in this case, if you placed a plus, would tell the computer you're about to enter an order. So you might write discontinue Lasix. And because the computer recognizes that as a legitimate order, it takes your natural uh, sentence that you write as the order, can, and if it can cons successfully convert that into a uh, order on the computer side, it then turns it green. If I were to write uh, Lasix 800 milligrams POBID, it knows that this is not a reasonable order, the dose is far too high, and therefore it rejects what I've entered, turning it red. Uh, you, there's other markup language you could use, such as a slash command to bring in a consult for cardiology, again turning green because it recognizes it, and you could use the at command to bring in uh, another physician into this conversation thread. Admittedly, when this markup language was built back in 2016, the only systems I knew which were using it uh, that were common were Wikipedia as well as WordPress text editors. Since then, a lot more systems have adopted this and have actually added a lot uh, more ways to make this user-friendly. One particular computer system which I have really like in the last few years is uh, ClickUp.com, which is a workflow or uh, a team workspace manager, and they use a slash command really well, where if you enter a slash, it brings up a pop-up with the uh, various different uh, markup commands you can use. And then this allows users who haven't memorized these commands to easily uh, navigate them. You could also use a markup language. I haven't published it in this case, but you can allow a clinician to enter into a free text box a complete note using a markup language. And then that note would actually automatically format itself as you mark it up to a structure issues, problems, uh, orders, and discrete data fields, essentially being able to eliminate the need for radial buttons, drop-downs, menus, and all the things which plague contemporary note generation in current EHR systems. We'll pull back here, back to the overview of the entire medical record system. And what I would like to drop, draw your attention to is the uh, tab feature. So if you were to press the tab button on your keyboard, it would bring up the side panel. You could also hide the side panel by clicking the tab button on your keyboard again. On the side panel, we have the tasks. At the top, we have your notes and orders, which are currently in progress in the open chart. You can save these to review later or for another clinician to sign off on, or you could actually go on to submit them. Underneath it, we have the task and to-do list manager for yourself and shared with your team. And we then have the activity feed. The activity feed shows both the past and the upcoming activity for this patient. And it incorporates everything, their labs, their notes, their consults, their medications. And you could very easily scroll this feed up and down to see everything which has happened to the patient and everything which is about to happen and scheduled for the patient. And of course, as you... Uh, scrub through this activity feed, you can have it correspondingly update the interface of the notes workspace and the overview workspace. Similar to that time machine scrubbing as described earlier. The very last field here is called clippings. And this is all the uh, various different uh, reports and data fields that you've sort of cut out and copied into your clipping section. And you can either incorporate these later into a note, you can review these to try to uh, summarize together, or you can bundle all your clippings together and pass them on as an attachment for the uh, next consultant to review together. A really important part of this record has been trying to introduce a certain level of safety. And one of the big major sources of medication error on medical electronic medical records is the people placing orders on the wrong patient. And so in this case, when you go in to submit an order uh, for a patient, it ends up um, displaying the patient's face, their photo, their name, their uh, room number, right beside the order. Again, hoping to try to reduce the chance that someone's placing the wrong meds on the wrong patient. I've experimented in the past trying to figure out a way to create 
a sixth sense or a subconscious feel to, so that people know they're in the correct chart for the correct patient, trying to use uh, patient-specific patterns which reside on the periphery of the user interface so that in your peripheral vision, you would know that a patient with the red uh, edged chart with small triangles in it, for instance, uh, is this particular patient, just as when you pick up a paper chart, you know intuitively based on how uh, old the chart is, how thick it is, what it smells like, whether you have the right chart or not. Uh, unfortunately, the drafts were very ugly, and so they weren't included in this presentation, but perhaps I'll present that in the future. The, the very last thing here I want to just comment on as well is the rational use of color. I just kind of screwed it up in this case with the activity feed, but the initial intent always was that the color palette should be bland, making it uh, neutral, not busy, not cluttered, and when color is used, it should be deliberate. So green was supposed to indicate, and again, there's a mistake here, but green was supposed to indicate uh, at a particular next actionable step for a patient. Blue was supposed to represent the navigation bars, and red was supposed to direct a user's attention to abnormal findings and areas for attention. What I would like to do now is on the right side of the screen where we have the summary panels of all the active issues, open up the active issue for COPD. We'll click on it and in this panel here, we are now looking at the COPD data capsule. And the data capsule concept is probably my favorite part of the whole medical record here in this design. You can see uh, the other active issues across the top bar, and if you want, you could have clicked on those to change the, their data capsules. A data capsule is a self-contained uh, capsule which has everything you need about that particular issue. So in COPD, it has the care team uh, providers, it has the medications related to the capsule, it has the previous medications, the tests which are relevant, so in COPD, pulmonary function tests and chest x-ray imaging, as well as all the notes which were ever written about that particular issue, both as an outpatient or as a walk-in or during an admission. And you can scroll these notes back and forth to see the trend on what's happened related to that particular issue. One of the important things to realize is that the capsule, to a certain extent, is self-generating, meaning that if the capsule knows that chest x-rays are an important part of that capsule, it will automatically pull in x-rays, even if they were done in other parts of the medical record for something else, for instance, for pneumonia. You can also uh, make you can really improve the way that people uh, document if you use capsule-directed documentation. So if a patient is, a, as an outpatient, uh, having changes to their medications for COPD, the, the outpatient physician can annotate the reasons for these changes inside the capsule, close the capsule, figuratively speaking, and then when the patient comes into hospital, the inpatient treating team will open up the patient's COPD capsule. They'll be able to add uh, more notes to the COPD capsule related to if they're having the exacerbation, if they make any medication changes, if they do further diagnostics, if they involve other care team members or consultants. And then all that information related to changing their COPD management, of course, it's contained in the capsule. And so when the patient goes back into the community, and a community physician sees that their person's on new medications, it's very easy to understand uh, what the new medications are and why they were changed and see the whole documentation all in one place. This is fundamentally different from the way which we currently do uh, communication, which involves writing one big note, which has a commentary on all of the issues at once, and then formatting, and then, sorry, and then forwarding this giant note uh, about one patient to you know half a dozen subspecialists who follow them. And so in the current system, we just generate a lot of uh, back and forth communication kind of in a shotgun manner. And it's actually hard for people to really follow the information that matters. And when thinking about information that matters, in theory, if you had a patient with very advanced rheumatoid arthritis that you had a particular uh, medication regime that you didn't want to change, if you were, let's say, their rheumatologist, you could set an alert 
on the rheumatology capsule, specifically on the medications, so that if the medications in the rheumatology capsule get changed, or if anyone updates the notes inside of that capsule, that then you get a push notification as the patient's rheumatologist. And so it really can help uh, fundamentally change the way which we do documentation, the way that we think about intra-hospital uh, and extra-hospital communication, um, and that we bring uh, information together. There, a lot more could be said on this topic, specifically the, around how to handle issues which are undifferentiated or evolve their diagnosis over time. The capsule methodology can easily uh, adapt and handle that as well. One last really big uh, feature we should speak about is the sandbox. That's under the graph tab, and we'll go look at it right here. As you can see, the uh, sandbox is a place which can allow physicians to really think about uh, the patient's chart. They can see uh, overviews of labs, of tests, of imaging, of notes, of symptoms, how they all fit together and have changed over time. You can use the sandbox or the graphing feature in a pre-configured state. In this case, it's already open to the infectious disease uh, pre-configuration for a five-year time span. But in theory, if you want, you could go in and manipulate any of these fields yourself, as we'll see in a second. The, the uh, sandbox view can, of course, also go full screen if you really want to throw a lot of data up on the screen at once and try to find out what the story is. One observation that was made by Dr. Jonathan Gold, which I really support and think is very astute, is that the order of these sections probably by default should be mirror that of a standard consultant note or H and P. And so probably uh, issues uh, and procedures should be at the top and then followed by you know meds, uh, labs, etc. In this case, the sandbox, as I said, is open to the infectious disease workflow. But if you wanted, you could add uh, anything else from vitals to imaging to clinic visits, symptoms, exams, and meds. These are all different discrete data fields which can be populated. In the case of the medications, we have a nitrofurotonin, which is a, a solid line over time, showing that the patient's been on it for a very long time. And you can see that the line thickness increases as time goes on, and this represents an increase in the dose relative to before. The discrete dots represent discrete, um, reasonably short periods of time that they were given particular medications. And of course, you can click on any item in here to pull up a hairline view, which cuts across the different fields, providing uh, more details of this data. We'll move now into the final section, where in the initial presentation, I showed some screenshots of real electronic health records, real EPRs. And at the time, I didn't realize that it's actually illegal to show screenshots of most EHR companies because of their predatory behaviors and suing clinicians who uh, show screenshots and review their user interfaces. And so in this presentation, we won't be looking at examples of real electronic health record systems. Um, the purpose of this was to try to show some of the contrast between the visualizations previously proposed and the uh, contemporary state. In particular, there's a huge difference in the level of data density in what we've looked at versus how most medical systems are designed, as well as uh, the complexity as far as the number of panels and tabs and windows and uh, dropdowns and menus, which uh, most systems have versus what we looked at before where almost everything was in uh, one click away. There's also a lot of very unused space on uh, the medical systems I've seen uh, out there. But unfortunately, we don't have the slides. And so to summarize, what I've tried to show is an electronic medical record system that uses a really efficient layout. We have this split screen workspace that you can scale to multiple monitors to increase your number of workspaces. You can uh, pull up whatever you want in each workspace. Uh, and compare side to side. Everything's within one click for the most part of your core information. Uh, there's high data density uh, throughout the entire uh, system, which allows you to really uh, 
act as a physician and uh, use data to make decisions. And the really big feature I would like to draw, talk about is data capsules, or I think I was using the term data encapsulation back in 2016, which is uh, being able to integrate all the required information about a particular issue uh, into one place to thread the notes, the orders, the meds, the labs, uh, all together. And this fundamentally changes uh, how we think about uh, documentation and uh, the digital medical chart, which is important because when we go from uh, paper medical charts to digital medical charts, we never really made the right level of innovation that we should have. Essentially, we just duplicated the layout of the paper medical chart with its tabs and index and folders in a digital form. But it wasn't the right approach. We really should have thought about how to use the digital technologies better. Now, of course, these mockups that we looked at aren't meant to be production ready. Uh, they're just concept designs. Uh, you obviously need a lot more re refinement and the detail to take these to development. And they leave a lot of functionality that EHRs have out. There just wasn't time to put it into the initial 10 minute presentation and a uh, few weeks that I had to kind of work on this project from scratch. There's a few other mockups I've worked on, which I'll uh, post in separate posts back from that two th this 2016 project. And the real big goal is to try to start a discussion. And if you found this interesting uh, as a clinician or as a designer or as a software developer or a programmer or someone involved in healthcare, uh, either on the treating side or as a patient, I would find it helpful if you share it with your friends or colleagues. And we need to have a better discussion around electronic health record interface design. As I mentioned, unfortunately, the legacy EHR vendors have essentially created a gag order, making it illegal, actually illegal, to discuss their bad user interfaces. Um, I'll write about that a little bit in the future as far as the predatory practices from preventing physicians from posting, discussing, and doing research on their bad EHR designs. But please use this as a starting point. I would love to hear criticism, um, things which you found valuable. And if you like the presentation, as I said, this is from over two and a half years ago. I, I fortunately have had a chance in the last few months to get back into doing medical record mock-up design. And my more recent work from October 1st, 2018, the EHR design from first principles presentation is available on YouTube. And the slides are also in the corresponding blog post if you don't want to watch the YouTube video. Again, you can uh, write to me at gschmidt at medmb.ca or uh, find me via Twitter or the website. Of course, these slides, if you're interested, are also all available in the link in this video to the initial post. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this is something which I think uh, we will get to as a medical community. We're going to actually have very good software, I suspect, in the near future as more and more uh, new players come into the electronic health record space, each being able to almost start from this concept design, as that we talked about here, being able to not have the baggage of past uh, constraints and past systems and try to think about how something should operate. Thank you very much. See you in the next video.